The UI toolkit is the way of the future, especially for editor tooling. I know not all of you are sold on using UI toolkit at runtime, but for the editor, I can't think of a good compelling reason not to use it. In this video, we're gonna cover how to create your own custom editor window with UI toolkit, where you can do things like draw handles in the scene view, save load data, whatever you wanna do there. This was critical for me was implementing my free and open source micro game, mini golf, where you can download the full project off GitHub for free. And of course, play the full game on itch also for free. Links in the description, to both of those. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you, ooh, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become a reality by helping you level up your editor tooling game so you can iterate faster on your actual game. Now, if you're not familiar with UI Toolkit, it's Unity's new framework, the first one since Unity 4.6. And it's more modeled after web development where we use XML markup to structure the layout of the page. And we use USS, Unity style sheets. Then of course we have a backing class that's our controller to handle things like button clicks or what have you. This is in stark contrast to the old IM GUI system for editor tooling, where you had to write code for literally everything and it was very verbose. If you ever did Java swing development, it was basically like that, kind of a pain in the butt. So in my opinion, this is a much easier way to create your UIs. Now, while this video is gonna be focused on implementing something that I did in the mini golf micro game, you're still gonna learn the concepts and the aspects that you need to know to make your own editor window and some cool things that you can do with that. We're gonna be adding fields, texts, buttons, warning labels, and of course, handling button presses in the C-sharp class. Let's go. This window right here on the right side is what we're gonna be making today. It's got a title, a path that we're gonna save the world scene to, the name of the file that we want it to save, this button that will actually perform the save, and then a secondary section where we're gonna load something that will allow us to select only objects of that type. So we've got 12 levels currently. And when we click load, we'll see our scene's gonna change. Oh, well, that's the same one we have. So let's pick a different one. When we click load, we'll see that the scene changes so we can see that thing. And we can also clear it if we wanna start fresh. We've got a few buttons. If we try to overwrite something that already exists, we're gonna warn ourselves that. And if we do something like this, we're gonna also inform us that we're gonna actually create that because maybe this means that there's an error and we don't want this folder path. Maybe we want this folder path instead. So this is all done with the UI toolkit. It can be done with IM GUI, but I feel like it's a lot more complicated to do it that way. So let's take a look at how this is made. In our project panel, this is all with one C-sharp script, one style sheet, one UXML, and I've got my assembly definition. That's not really important for this one. So let's start with looking at the UXML. If you double click a UXML file, it'll actually open up for you in UI Builder. I did not use UI Builder to make this. And in my opinion, using UI Builder is a little bit more cumbersome than making it yourself once you know what you're doing with the UXML. So the UI Builder, we can drag and drop containers, controls, whatever we want to do into the little scene. Let's call it a scene here, the canvas, however you want to call this, and put all this stuff together. You can also hook up the style sheets. The style sheet's the only thing I do with UI Builder because it ends up looking a little bit weird in the UXML. You can create new ones or add an existing one. So I'll just create one and then put all my styles in there or link any that I need to be involved. So remember that this is an XML layout. What we see in the middle of the viewport is XML and it's strictly for the layout. All the styling should be done with our style sheets. So in our hierarchy, we can see all of the components here. I'm gonna get out of here and show you the UXML just because that's how I work on this. I feel that ends up being a lot easier to use. Instead of having to hop back and forth between like your code editor for the styles and then back here, it's just, to me, it's a little bit annoying. Okay, so what we saw was at the top, we have an input for where do we wanna save this thing, right? The important part is because we're using XML namespaces here, we'll have all the classes that are under Uni Engine UI elements. So if we do UI, that will let us put in anything that comes from this namespace, which we have the text field. We're gonna to wanna to label it where it says save to. Most of the time I find that we want to provide names for all of these things so we can easily find them in our controller. So I'm gonna give this a name of directory input. And let's give it a default value by providing a value. And I'm gonna just pick where I want this to be, but this can be any path in your project. This happens to be where I want in my project to save these files, but you can set this to be whatever makes sense for your project. That's all we have to do. Remember, we're only focused on the layout and potentially what classes we want to add to provide styling. 
So next, if this folder doesn't exist, I wanna provide a warning. So let's go ahead and do a UI label, and that's just text. We'll call it missing folder warning. And then whatever we want it to say is in the text field. So let's say the folder does not exist. This will be created on save. And we're gonna give it a class now called warning. So anything with the class warning, we're gonna style here in a little bit to make it look fancy, like what you can see at the bottom right of your screen. And we're gonna actually duplicate this because we're gonna to wanna to do basically the same thing for the file name. So I'm just gonna copy paste these. The text field, we're gonna make it say file name instead. We'll call it file name input. I'm just gonna give it a value of one by default. And for this warning, we're gonna call it the override file warning and say that the file already exists at this path and we're gonna override that file if we save. And we're gonna keep that same class warning so these are gonna look identical. Now we're gonna want a button, so that's under the UI still. We'll call it save button, and what text should it have? It'll say save the file. Now we wanna delineate between our saving and our loading. So we might add in a new label. We'll set the text to be load from save and attach a header class. And don't worry about these styles, we're gonna come back to them. Underneath our header here is file input that only allows us to select a specific type. If we don't specify the type, we can pick any arbitrary object and then it's not gonna work properly. And because we're gonna select something from our project, we're gonna use the editor namespace here, and we're gonna pick the object field, which gives us this style of input. We're gonna call it the load file field. We'll give it the label just a file. And then very importantly, we have to give it the type. And this is a little bit weird. You have to give the fully qualified type, including the assembly definition. So for me, I have a class called level scriptable object that's under this namespace. And because it's in a assembly definition, we also have to define that here with a comma space and then the assembly definition. So a little bit tricky. If you're not using assembly definitions, you can probably get away with just this. And if you really struggle with it, you can use the UI builder that makes it a little bit easier and it'll pre-populate this for you. If you can't select the right file in UI builder, you can come here and say select type. It gives you this cool search window and you can find whatever it is you're looking for. So I have level SO. Shows up here, we can just click on that and we can see it comes out to be the same thing. If you wanna select game objects, we can just click that and we'll see it's the Unity Engine game object from the Unity Engine core module assembly. Now to get this warning with a button together, I want them to be horizontally aligned. If you just need something to group stuff together, you can just use a visual element. If you're an OG web developer, you might consider this like a div. Everything we've done up until we made this visual element is what we call a self-closing tag. And that's where it ends with this slash and then the greater than sign. That means that this element doesn't have any children. It's functionally the same as just putting no children, but it's a little bit shorter. What we've done on this visual element is said that we're gonna put something in between these two tags and those are considered child elements of the visual element. Like our root level UI XML tag here, we are putting all of our stuff inside of there. And at the bottom, we have a closing tag of slash UI UXML. For most fields, we don't need to put anything inside of them because they've got like a text that goes inside. But for things like visual elements that are containers, we usually wanna put something inside of them. And that's why we're doing the visual element differently than all the rest of the fields that we put in here. I'm gonna assign a bunch of classes here because I like to have relatively simple and straightforward classes. You could just call this one class and group all the style together. And again, we're gonna talk about what all of these are gonna do. So I've got flex row, which is gonna make us display stuff in line instead of stacked vertically. I'm gonna do flex wrap. So if it goes too far over our available space, it's gonna wrap. We're gonna put space between. So there's, well, space between the elements if there's enough space. And I want it to look like our other warnings. So you can see here, we've got a label that says warning, loading the file will destroy any scene changes. And then we've got a button that will actually load the file. So let's add in a label and a button make them say those things. We don't need to assign any name or any classes to this label because it's already inheriting all of that from the root visual element here. On the button, we're gonna make it say load file. We're gonna give it a name load button because we're gonna to need to reference it from our class. And we're gonna add the class pull right. So it's gonna be right aligned. And finally, we have this bottom button that says clear the tile map. Let's add that just below our visual element. We'll give that button the text that says clear tile map the name clear button and a class warning button because it's gonna look a little bit different than the rest of our warning stuff. Now that we've built out the UXML, let's take a look at how does it look when there's no styles. It, this is functional, it just doesn't look very good. And our warnings aren't clearly warnings. It's at least doing the thing, right? I'm gonna show you the USS and I'm gonna have a link to Unity's documentation on the USS. There's just a lot of stuff kind of copy pasted. So I think it's a little bit easier if we just talk about it. Everything you see here in purple is what we call a selector. So we have like dot warning, which is a selector. The dot indicates that we're picking a class name and the class name is warning. 
We also have the ability to define a selector that just picks based on the element type. Like down here at the bottom, we have button, which maps to our UI button element. You could also do things like object field, text, etc. We only have one piece of style here that's assigned to an element, that's a button. The rest of these are looking for classes that have that name. So hidden, that's how we get rid of something. We're just saying display none that says don't show anything. Warning, you can see we're having that yellow color. It's a little bit bigger. We've got some padding. It's got that background color and a border that's slightly rounded. The warning button, we can see we're just assigning that background color to be yellow and black text. Space between here is putting this space between our text and our button and flex row is making it so these show inline instead of stacked like what we just saw. And you can see here our header load from save. It's even bigger than the warning and we've said it's going to be a bold font style. Nothing crazy here, but it makes it look a little bit nicer and makes the important things stand out. Let's take a look at that backing class, our controller, if you will, to see how do we manage hiding different fields, actually doing the save, load, and all the rest of this stuff. Okay, so we've got our level saver window. Very importantly, this has to be in a folder called editor. You'll see from our project that we're under level management editor. If you don't put it in here, it's not gonna work properly and you're going to have some compile errors whenever you try to build your game. This is a special folder that Unity automatically excludes from builds because it's labeled editor. And I also have my assembly definition to make it where it only goes to the editor. For our level saver window, it's very important that we make it extend the editor window class. We're going to look at how we get all these things like missing tile map warning in just a minute. But first, it's super important that you have a public static void that has a menu item associated with it to bring up that window. You can see we are under tools, tile map level saver. And then we have the show window that will do level saver window. Window equals get window level saver window. And we're going to set the title to be a map level saver. So in Unity, you'll now see tools, tile map level saver, and we'll see that level saver window with a map icon. So the menu item, this is where it's gonna show up on the Unity editor, and this is gonna be the title of that panel. The get window is how we make it, make a new instance of this window or give us a reference to our existing window. That's something built into the editor window class that we're subclassing. Create GUI is a special function that the editor window will automatically call to build out the content of your window. Whenever this gets created, you can load, here, let's put this down here. We can load the visual tree asset that points the full path to our UXML. So this path will change based on wherever you saved your UXML file. You then wanna say asset.clonetree root, which will take everything that's in this UXML and push it into that root visual element. Once you've done that, it's safe to query your root visual element for anything that we've named. Like we have our file name input, our directory input. We can query these by name once we've performed this step but you'll notice that we're not directly querying for those because up here at the top where we have each of these types of things like a directory input, our file name input, what we're doing here is called an expression bodied property saying if we're going to try to access the directory input, it's going to do root visual element Q, which is shorthand for query. We're gonna look for a text field and it should have this name, directory input. Now you don't have to only query by name, but that tends to be the easiest way to do it. You can also query by class. I find most of the time you don't want to do that. The name is just the simplest, easiest way to do this, as long as you guarantee you're going to have unique names. So that's all we're doing in this whole block here is finding the element by doing our root visual element dot query for that type, providing the name for each of the things that we defined in our UXML. This expression bodied member is something that came around with a newer C sharp that Unity supports. But for whatever reason, you're getting a compiler error. If you open up your project settings player, other settings, scroll down to configuration API compatibility level, make sure you got .NET standard 2.1. That will make it where this works for you properly. So this makes it just a little bit easier to reference all of these things so we don't have to assign them all with a million lines of code right here in this create GUI. But if you skip this step or try to refer to any of these properties before you've cloned, you will get a null reference exception because it's not gonna be able to find that element. So it's extremely important you do these two things before you try to reference any of these properties. By the way, I'm using Rider, the best C-sharp IDE made by JetBrains. I've got a link in the description that'll get you 25% off an annual subscription to Rider with the code LAM Academy. Highly recommend you check this out. I've been using JetBrains products for over 10 years and I just love their IDEs. The next thing we wanna look at is how do we bind event 
handlers to our buttons. We've got three buttons here, save, load, and clear tile map. So you just register a callback of a click event and provide the function that you want it to call. If we scroll down here to our saved file, it's just a private void saved file that accepts a click event. I don't care about the click event with how I handle this, so I'm using the discard naming here. If you need to refer to something on the click event, you can name it something like click event. The last thing I want to show to you is how do we do things like draw scene handles? Because remember, in the scene view, we're drawing this red bounds. And I did that because whenever the ball goes outside of these bounds, I want it to reset. And I wanted to know where that was and to make sure that was going to look OK. Normally, if you're doing like a custom editor for something like your script, you can just do on scene GUI. But this works regardless of what's selected as long as this window is here. So if you want to persistently draw stuff in the scene, you need some way to do that. In our level saver window, we have this private void on became visible. This is called whenever we first initialize our window. So it's guaranteed to be called and start drawing whenever we have this window available. Now you'll see in here we have a static reference to scene view and there's this delegate during scene GUI. This gives us a hook into effectively the on scene GUI callback where we can use our handles API calls to do all kinds of stuff, draw boxes, draw arrows, pretty much anything you can normally think to do inside of an inspector on scene GUI we can do here, but from an editor window and that's really cool. For safety, we're removing any dangling on scene GUI references from that during scene GUI and then assigning a new one. And for good hygiene, we also remove it on destroy, which is automatically called whenever we remove this window. So on my scene GUI that accepts the scene view, I'm making sure that we have a tile map and a grid. They're both not null. If they are not null, we're going to create some bounds. This is also a pretty neat trick. You can do bounds.encapsulate another renderer bounds and the bounds will continually expand to exactly encompass all of the renderers that you've tried to encapsulate. So if it's the first child that's not the tile map render, I just set the bounds to be that and we continually expand them. Because we use bounds int for a tile map, I've expanded it to be times two, double the size. We set the handles color to be red and then we just draw the wire cube based on the bounds int here. The key takeaway for this section is we can draw handles like cubes, sphere caps, disks, whatever you want to draw on the scene by attaching it with the scene view dot during scene GUI. This was a critical tool for me while I was making this mini golf micro game. I really don't like the additive scene workflow. It just leaves a lot of room for error, accidental things coming in. So having one scene that's the game scene where we can dynamically build out the level at runtime was a huge time saver and made me feel a lot more confident I was going to mess something up on accident and also ensured a consistent visual style throughout the game. It also let me very quickly iterate on these levels. If I mess something up, I could just reload exactly where I saved it, save it again, and keep moving on. If you got value out of this video, please like and subscribe. Share this video out with somebody else who will get value out of this. That helps me out so much. And if you want to show your support monetarily, you can get yourself some Llama Academy merch right here on YouTube. It's my favorite shirt, best one in my opinion. You can also use the affiliate links down in the description to do your Unity Asset Store shopping. I know you're going to buy some assets. Use that link. You can also become a YouTube member or Patreon supporter. If you do that at any tier, you'll get access to the members exclusive Discord server. At the phenomenal and the tremendous tier, you'll also get access to this exclusive Dissolve shader, as well as the awesome tier benefits, which include getting a shout out at the end of every video, like Ivan, Iphigabolus, Perry, and Mustafa. And of course, at the supporter tier and higher, you get your name up on every single video and your name in every single GitHub repository released while you're a supporter. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.